Jane Eyre, Chapter 21. Presentiments are strange things, and so are sympathies, and so are signs, and the three combined make one mystery to which humanity has not yet found the key. I never laughed at presentiments in my life because I have had strange ones of my own. Sympathies, I believe, exist. For instance, between far distant, long absent, wholly estranged relatives asserting, notwithstanding their alienation, the unity of the source to which each traces his origin, whose workings baffle mortal comprehension, and signs, for aught we know, may be but the sympathies of nature with man. When I was a little girl, only six years old, I one night heard Bessie Levin say to Martha Abbott that she had been dreaming about a little child and that to dream of children was a sure sign of trouble either to oneself or one's kin. The saying might have worn out of my memory had not a circumstance immediately followed which served indelibly to fix it there. The next day Bessie was sent for home to the deathbed of her little sister. Of late, I had often recalled this saying and this incident, for during the past week, scarcely a night had gone over my couch that had not brought with it a dream of an infant, which I sometimes hushed in my arms, sometimes dandled on my knee, sometimes watched playing with daisies on a lawn, or again dabbling its hands in running water. It was a wailing child this night and a laughing one the next. Now it nestled close to me, and now it ran from me, but whatever mood the apparition evinced, whatever aspect it wore, it failed not for seven successive nights to meet me the moment I entered the land of slumber. I did not like this iteration of one idea, this strange recurrence of one image, and I grew nervous as bedtime approached and the hour of the vision drew near. It was from companionship with this baby phantom I had been roused on that moonlit night when I heard the cry, and it was on the afternoon of the day following I was summoned downstairs by a message that someone wanted me in Mrs. Fairfax's room. On repairing thither, I found a man waiting for me, having the appearance of a gentleman's servant. He was dressed in deep mourning, and the hat he held in his hand was surrounded with a crepe band. I dare say you hardly remember me, miss, he said, rising as I entered. But my name is Levin. I lived coachman with Mrs. Reed when you were at Gateshead, eight or nine years since, and I live there still. Oh, Robert, how do you do? I remember you very well. You used to give me a ride sometimes on Miss Georgiana's bay pony. And how is Bessie? You are married to Bessie. Yes, miss. My wife is very hearty, thank you. She brought me another little one about two months since. We have three now, and both mother and child are thriving. And are the family well at the house, Robert? I am sorry I cannot give you better news of them, miss. They are very badly at present, in great trouble. I hope no one is dead, I said, glancing at his black dress. He too looked down at the crepe round his hat and replied, Mr. John died yesterday was a week at his chambers in London. Mr. John? Yes. And how does his mother bear it? Why, you see, Miss Eyre, it is not a common mishap. His life has been very wild. These last three years he gave himself up to strange ways, and his death was shocking. I heard from Bessie that he was not doing well. <laughs> doing well. He could not do worse. He ruined his health and his estate amongst the worst men and the worst women. He got into debt and into jail. His mother helped him out twice, but as soon as he was free, he returned to his old companions and habits. His head was not strong. The knaves he lived amongst fooled him beyond anything I ever heard. He came down to Gateshead about three weeks ago and wanted Mrs. to give up all to him. Mrs. refused. Her means have long been much reduced by his extravagance. So he went back again and the next news was that he was dead. How he died, God knows. They say he killed himself. I was silent. The tidings were frightful. Robert Levin resumed. Mrs. had been out of health herself for some time. She had got very stout, but was not strong with it, and the loss of money and fear of poverty were quite breaking her down. The information about Mr. John's death and the manner of it came too suddenly. It brought on a stroke. She was three days without speaking, but last Tuesday she seemed rather better. She appeared as if she wanted to say something and kept making signs to my wife and mumbling. It was only yesterday morning, however, that Bessie understood she was pronouncing your name, and at last she made up the words, Bring Jane. Fetch Jane Eyre. I want to speak to her.
Bessie is not sure whether she is in her right mind or means anything by the words, but she told Miss Reed and Miss Georgiana and advised them to send for you. The young ladies put it off at first, but their mother grew so restless and said, Jane, Jane, so many times that at last they consented. I left Gateshead yesterday, and if you can get ready, Miss, I should like to take you back with me early tomorrow morning. Yes, Robert, I shall be ready. It seems to me that I ought to go. I think so too, Miss. Bessie said she was sure you would not refuse, but I suppose you will have to ask leave before you can get off. Yes, and I will do it now. And having directed him to the servants' hall and recommended him to the care of John's wife and the attentions of John himself, I went in search of Mr. Rochester. He was not in any of the lower rooms. He was not in the yard, the stables, or the grounds. I asked Mrs. Fairfax if she had seen him. Yes, she believed he was playing billiards with Miss Ingram. To the billiard room I hastened. The click of balls and the hum of voices resounded thence. Mr. Rochester, Miss Ingram, the two Mrs. Eshton, and their admirers were all busied in the game. It required some courage to disturb so interesting a party. My errand, however, was one I could not defer, so I approached the master where he stood at Miss Ingram's side. She turned as I drew near and looked at me haughtily. Her eyes seemed to demand, what can the creeping creature want now? And when I said in a low voice, Mr. Rochester, she made a movement as if tempted to order me away. I remember her appearance at the moment. It was very graceful and very striking. She wore a morning robe of sky blue crepe. A gauzy azure scarf was twisted in her hair. She had been all animation with the game, and irritated pride did not lower the expression of her haughty lineaments. Does that person want you? She inquired of Mr. Rochester, and Mr. Rochester turned to see who the person was. He made a curious grimace, one of his strange and equivocal demonstrations, threw down his cue and followed me from the room. Well, Jane, he said, as he rested his back against the schoolroom door, which he had shut. If you please, sir, I want leave of absence for a week or two. What to do? Where to go? To see a sick lady who has sent for me. What sick lady? Where does she live? At Gateshead in Shire. Shire? That is a hundred miles off. Who may she be that sends for people to see her at that distance? Her name is Reed, sir. Mrs. Reed. Reed of Gateshead. There was a Reed of Gateshead, a magistrate. It is his widow, sir. And what have you to do with her? How do you know her? Mr. Reed was my uncle, my mother's brother. The deuce he was. You never told me that before. You always said you had no relations. None that would own me, sir. Mr. Reed is dead and his wife cast me off. Why? Because I was poor and burdensome and she disliked me. But Reed left children. You must have cousins. Sir George Lynn was talking of a Reed of Gateshead yesterday, who, he said, was one of the veriest rascals on town. And Ingram is mentioning a Georgiana Reed of the same place, who was much admired for her beauty a season or two ago in London. John Reed is dead too, sir. He ruined himself and half ruined his family and is supposed to have committed suicide. The news so shocked his mother that it brought about an apoplectic attack. And what good can you do to her? Nonsense, Jane. I would never think of running a hundred miles to see an old lady who will, perhaps, be dead before you can reach her. Besides, you say she cast you off. Yes, sir, but that is long ago and when her circumstances were very different. I could not be easy to neglect her wishes now. How long will you stay? As short a time as possible, sir. Promise me only to stay a week. I had better not pass my word. I might be obliged to break it. At all events, you will come back. You will not be induced under any pretext to take up a permanent residence with her. Oh, no, I shall certainly return if all be well. And who goes with you? You don't travel a hundred miles alone. No, sir, she has sent her coachman. A person to be trusted? Yes, sir, he has lived ten years in the family. Mr. Rochester meditated. When do you wish to go? Early tomorrow morning, sir. Well, you must have some money. You can't travel without money, and I dare say you have not much. I have given you no salary yet. How much have you in the world, Jane? He asked, smiling. I drew out my purse, a meager thing it was. Five shillings, sir. He took the purse, poured the hoard into his palm, and chuckled over it as if its scantiness amused him. Soon he produced his pocketbook. Here, said he, offering me a note. It was fifty pounds, but he owed me but fifteen. I told him I had no change. 
I don't want change. You know that. Take your wages. I declined accepting more than was my due. He scowled at first, then, as if recollecting something, he said, Right, right. Better not give you all now. You would perhaps stay away three months if you had fifty pounds. There are ten. Is it not plenty? Yes, sir, but now you owe me five. Come back for it, then. I am your banker for forty pounds. Mr. Rochester, I may as well mention another matter of business to you while I have the opportunity. Matter of business? I am curious to hear it. You have as good as informed me, sir, that you are going to shortly be married. Yes, what then? In that case, sir, Adele ought to go to school. I am sure you will perceive the necessity of it. To get her out of my bride's way, who might otherwise walk over her rather too emphatically? There's sense in the suggestion, not a doubt of it. Adele, as you say, must go to school, and you, of course, must march straight to the devil? I hope not, sir, but I must seek another situation somewhere. In course, he exclaimed with a twang of a voice and a distortion of features, equally fantastic and ludicrous. He looked at me some minutes. And old Madame Reed or the Misses, her daughters, will be solicited by you to seek a place, I suppose? No, sir, I am not on such terms with my relatives as would justify me in asking favors of them. But I shall advertise. You shall walk up the pyramids of Egypt, he growled. At your peril, you advertise. I wish I had only offered you a sovereign instead of ten pounds. Give me back nine pounds, Jane. I've a use for it. And so have I, sir, I returned, putting my hands and my purse behind me. I could not spare the money on any account. Little Nygaard, said he, refusing me a pecuniary request. Give me five pounds, Jane. Not five shillings, sir, nor five pence. Just let me look at the cash. No, sir, you are not to be trusted. Jane, sir, promise me one thing. I'll promise you anything, sir, that I think I'm likely to perform not to advertise and to trust this quest of a situation to me i'll find you one in time i shall be glad to do so sir if you in your turn will promise that i and adele shall be both safe out of the house before your bride enters it very well very well i'll pledge my word on it you go tomorrow then yes sir early shall you come down to the drawing room after dinner no sir i must prepare for the journey then you and I must bid good-bye for a little while. I suppose so, sir. And how do people perform that ceremony of parting, Jane? Teach me. I am not quite up to it. They say farewell or any other form they prefer. Then say it. Farewell, Mr. Rochester, at present. What must I say? The same, if you like, sir. Farewell, Miss Eyre, for the present. Is that all? Yes. It seems stingy to my notions, and dry and unfriendly. I should like something else, a little addition to the right. If one shook hands, for instance. But no, that would not content me either. So you'll do no more than say farewell, Jane. It is enough, sir, as much goodwill may be conveyed in one hearty word as in many. Very likely, but it is blank and cool. Farewell. How long is he going to stand with his back against the door, I asked myself. I want to commence my packing. The dinner bell rang, and suddenly away he bolted without another syllable. I saw him no more that day and was off before he had risen in the morning. I reached the lodge at Gateshead about five o'clock in the afternoon on the 1st of May. I stepped in there before going up to the hall. It was very clean and neat. The ornamental windows were hung with little white curtains. The floor was spotless. The grate and fire irons were burnished bright, and the fire burned clear. Bessie sat on the hearth, nursing her last born, and Robert and his sister played quietly in a corner. Bless you, I knew you would come, exclaimed Mrs. Levin as I entered. Yes, Bessie, said I after I had kissed her, and I trust I am not too late. How is Mrs. Reed? Alive still, I hope? Yes, she is alive and more sensible and collected than she was. The doctor says she may linger a week or two yet, but he hardly thinks she will finally recover. Has she mentioned me lately? She was talking of you only this morning and wishing you would come, but she is sleeping now or was ten minutes ago when I was up at the house. She generally lies in a kind of lethargy all afternoon and wakes up about six or seven. Will you rest yourself here an hour, miss, and then I will go up with you? Robert here entered, and Bessie laid her sleeping child in the cradle and went to welcome him. Afterward, she insisted on taking off my bonnet and having some tea, for she said I looked pale and tired. 
I was glad to accept her hospitality, and I submitted to being relieved of my traveling garb, just as passively as I used to let her undress me when I was a child. Old times crowded fast back on me as I watched her bustling about, setting out the tea tray with her best china, cutting bread and butter, toasting a tea cake, and between whiles giving little Robert or Jane an occasional tap or push, just as she used to give me in former days. Bessie had retained her quick temper as well as her light foot and good looks. Tea ready, I was going to approach the table, but she desired me to sit still, quite in her old preemptory tones. I must be served at the fireside, she said, and she placed before me a little round stand with my cup and a plate of toast, absolutely as she used to accommodate me with some privately purloined dainty on a nursery chair, and I smiled and obeyed her as in bygone days. She wanted to know if I was happy at Thornfield Hall, and what sort of person the mistress was, and when I told her there was only a master, whether he was a nice gentleman and whether I liked him. I told her he was rather an ugly man, but quite a gentleman, and that he treated me kindly, and that I was content. Then I went on to describe to her the gay company that had lately been staying at the house, and to these details Bessie listened with interest. They were precisely of the kind she relished. In such conversation, an hour was soon gone. Bessie restored me to my bonnet, etc., and accompanied by her, I quitted the lodge for the hall. It was also accompanied by her that I had, nearly nine years ago, walked down the path I was now ascending. On a dark, misty, raw morning in January, I had left a hostile roof, with a desperate and embittered heart, a sense of outlawry and almost of reprobation, to seek the chilly harborage of Lowood, that born so far away and unexplored. The same hostile roof now again rose before me. My prospects were doubtful yet, and I had yet an aching heart. I still felt as a wanderer on the face of the earth, but I experienced firmer trust in myself and my own powers and less withering dread of oppression. The gaping wound of my wrongs, too, was now quite healed, and the flame of resentment extinguished. You shall go into the breakfast room first, said Bessie, as she preceded me through the hall. The young ladies will be there. In another moment, I was within that apartment. There was every article of furniture looking just as it did on the morning I was first introduced to Mr. Brocklehurst. The very rug he had stood upon still covered the hearth. Glancing at the bookcases, I thought I could distinguish the two volumes of Bewick's British Birds occupying their old place on the third shelf and Gulliver's Travels and the Arabian Nights ranged up just above. The inanimate objects were not changed, but the living things had altered past recognition. Two young ladies appeared before me, one very tall, almost as tall as Miss Ingram, very thin too, with a sallow face and severe mien. There was something ascetic in her look, which was augmented by the extreme plainness of a straight-skirted, black, stuffed dress and a starched linen collar, hair combed away from the temples, and the nun-like ornament of a string of ebony beads and a crucifix. This, I felt sure, was Eliza, though I could trace little resemblance to her former self in that elongated and colorless visage. The other was certainly Georgiana, but not the Georgiana I remembered, the slim and fairy-like girl of eleven. This was a full-blown, very plump damsel, fair as waxwork, with handsome and regular features, languishing blue eyes and ringleted yellow hair. The hue of her dress was black, too, but its fashion was so different from her sister's, so much more flowing and becoming, it looked as stylish as the others looked puritanical. In each of the sisters there was one trait of the mother and only one. The thin and pallid elder daughter had her parents' cairngorm eye. The blooming and luxuriant younger girl had her contour of jaw and chin, perhaps a little softened, but still imparting an indescribable hardness to the countenance, otherwise so voluptuous and buxom. Both ladies, as I advanced, rose to welcome me, and both addressed me by the name of Miss Eyre. Eliza's greeting was delivered in a short, abrupt voice, without a smile, and then she sat down again, fixed her eye on the fire, and seemed to forget me. Georgiana added to her, how do you do, several commonplaces about my journey, the weather, and so on, uttered in a rather drawing tone and accompanied by sundry side glances that measured me from head to foot, now traversing the folds of my drab merino pelisse, and now lingering on the plain trimming of my cottage bonnet. Young ladies have a remarkable way of letting you know that they think you are a quiz without actually saying the words. A certain superciliousness of look, coolness of manner, nonchalance of tone, etc 
express fully their sentiments on the point without committing them by any positive rudeness in word or deed. A sneer, however, whether covert or open, had now no longer that power over me as it once possessed. As I sat between my cousins, I was surprised to find how easy I felt under the total neglect of the one and the semi-sarcastic attentions of the other. Eliza did not mortify, nor Georgiana ruffle me. The fact was, I had other things to think about. Within the last few months, feelings had been stirred in me so much more potent than any they could rise. Pains and pleasures so much more acute and exquisite had been excited than any it was in their power to inflict or bestow that their airs gave me no concern either for good or bad how is mrs reed i asked soon looking calmly at georgiana who thought fit to bridle at the direct address as if it was an unexpected liberty mrs reed oh mamma you mean she is extremely poorly i doubt if you can see her tonight if, said I, you would just step upstairs and tell her I am come, I should be much obliged to you. Georgiana almost started, and she opened her blue eyes wild and wide. I know she had a particular wish to see me, I added, and I would not defer attending to her desire longer than is absolutely necessary. Mama dislikes being disturbed in the evening, remarked Eliza. I soon rose, quietly took off my bonnet and gloves, uninvited, and said I would just step out to Bessie, who was, I dared say, in the kitchen, and ask her to ascertain whether Mrs. Reed was disposed to receive me or not tonight. I went, and having found Bessie and dispatched her on my errand, I proceeded to take further measures. It had heretofore been my habit always to shrink from arrogance. Received as I had been today, I should a year ago have resolved to quit Skate's head the very next morning. Now it was disclosed to me all at once that would be a foolish plan. I had taken a journey of a hundred miles to see my aunt, and I must stay with her till she was better or dead. As to her daughter's pride or folly, I must put it on one side, make myself independent of it. So I addressed the housekeeper, asked her to show me a room, told her I should probably be a visitor here a week or two, had my trunk conveyed to my chamber, and followed it thither myself. I met Bessie on the landing. Mrs. is awake, said she. I have told her you are here. Come and let us see if she will know you. I did not need to be guided to the well-known room, to which I had so often been summoned for chastisement or reprimand in former days. I hastened before Bessie. I softly opened the door. A shaded light stood on the table, for it was now getting dark. There was a great four-post bed with amber hangings as of old, where the toilet table, the armchair, and the footstool, at which I had a hundred times been sentenced to kneel, to ask pardon for offenses by me uncommitted. I looked into a certain corner near, half expecting to see the slim outline of a once dreaded switch which used to lurk there, waiting to leap out imp-like and lace my quivering palm or shrinking neck. I approached the bed. I opened the curtains and leant over the high-piled pillows. Well did I remember Mrs. Reed's face, and I eagerly sought the familiar image. It is a happy thing that time quells the longings of vengeance and hushes the promptings of rage and aversion. I had left this woman in bitterness and hate, and I came back to her now with no other emotion than a sort of ruth for her great sufferings, and a strong yearning to forget and forgive all injuries, to be reconciled and clasp hands in amity. The well-known face was there, stern, relentless as ever. There was that peculiar eye which nothing could melt, and the somewhat raised, imperious, despotic eyebrow. How often had it lowered on me menace and hate, and how the recollection of childhood terrors and sorrows revived as I traced its harsh line now. And yet I stooped down to kiss her. She looked at me. Is this Jane Eyre? she said. Yes, Aunt Reed. How are you, dear aunt? I had once vowed that I would never call her aunt again. I thought it no sin to forget and break that vow. My fingers had fastened on her hand, which lay outside the sheet. Had she pressed mine kindly, I should at that moment have experienced true pleasure. But unimpressionable natures are not so soon softened, nor are natural antipathies so readily eradicated. Mrs. Reed took her hand away, and turning her face rather from me, she remarked that the night was warm. Again, she regarded me so icily that I felt at once that her opinion of me, her feeling toward me, was unchanged and unchangeable. I knew by her stony eye, opaque to tenderness, dissoluble to tears, that she was resolved to consider me bad to the last, because to believe me good would give her no generous pleasure, only a sense of mortification. 
I felt pain, and then I felt ire, and then I felt a determination to subdue her, to be her mistress in spite of her nature and her will. My tears had risen just as in childhood. I ordered them back to their source. I brought a chair to the bedhead. I sat down and leaned over the pillow. You sent for me, I said, and I am here, and it is my intention to stay till I see how you get on. Oh, of course, you have seen my daughters? Yes. Well, you may tell them I wish you to stay till I can talk some things over with you I have on my mind. Tonight it is too late, and I have a difficulty in recalling them. But there was something I wished to say. Let me see. The wandering look and changed utterance told what wreck had been taken place on her once vigorous frame. Turning restlessly, she drew the bedclothes round her, my elbow resting on a corner of the quilt, fixed it down. She was at once irritated. Sit up, said she. Don't annoy me with holding the clothes fast. Are you Jane Eyre? I am Jane Eyre. I have had more trouble with that child than anyone would believe. Such a burden to be left on my hands, and so much annoyance as she caused me, daily and hourly, with her incomprehensible disposition, her sudden starts of temper, and her continually unnatural watchings of one's movements. I declare she talked to me once like something mad, or like a fiend. No child ever spoke or looked as she did. I was glad to get her away from the house. What did they do with her at Lowood? The fever broke out there, and many of the pupils died. She, however, did not die, but I said she did. I wish she had died. A strange wish, Mrs. Reed. Why do you hate her so? I had a dislike to her mother always, for she was my husband's only sister and a great favorite with him. He opposed the family's disowning her when she made her low marriage, and when news came of her death, he wept like a simpleton. He would send for the baby, though I entreated him rather to put it out to nurse and pay for its maintenance. I hated it the first time I set my eyes on it. A sickly, whining, pining thing. It would wail in its cradle all night long, not screaming heartily like any other child, but whimpering and moaning. Reed pitied it, and he used to nurse it and notice it as if it was his own, more indeed than he ever noticed his own at that age. He would try to make my children friendly to the little beggar. The darlings could not bear it, and he was angry with them when they showed their dislike. In his last illness, he had it brought continually to his bedside, and but an hour before he died, he bound me by vow to keep the creature. I would as soon have been charged with a pauper brat out of a workhouse, but he was weak, naturally weak. John does not at all resemble his father, and I am glad of it. John is like me, like my brothers. He is quite a Gibson. Oh, I wish he would cease tormenting me with letters for money. I have no more money to give him. We are getting poor. I must send away half the servants and shut up part of the house or let it off. I can never submit to that. Yet how are we to get on? Two thirds of my income goes in paying the interest of mortgages. John gambles dreadfully and always loses. Poor boy, he is beset by sharpers. John is sunk and degraded. His look is frightful. I feel ashamed for him when I see him. She was getting much excited. I think I had better leave her now, said I to Bessie, who stood on the other side of the bed. Perhaps you had, miss, but she often talks this way towards night. In the morning, she is calmer. I rose. Stop, exclaimed Mrs. Reed. There is another thing I wished to say. He threatens me. He continually threatens me with his own death or mine, and I dream sometimes that I see him laid out with a great wound in his throat or with a swollen and blackened face. I am come to a strange pass. I have heavy troubles. What is to be done? How is the money to be had? Bessie now endeavored to persuade her to take a sedative drought. She succeeded with difficulty. Soon after, Mrs. Reed grew more composed and sank into a dozing state. I then left her. More than ten days elapsed before I had again any conversation with her. She continued either delirious or lethargic, and the doctor forbade everything which could painfully excite her. Meantime, I got on as well as I could with Georgiana and Eliza. They were very cold indeed at first. Eliza would sit half the day sewing, reading, or writing, and scarcely utter a word either to me or her sister. Georgiana would chatter nonsense to her canary bird by the hour and take no notice of me. But I was determined not to seem at a loss for occupation or amusement. I had brought my drawing materials with me, and they served me for both. 
provided with a case of pencils and some sheets of paper, I used to take a seat apart from them near the window and busy myself in sketching fancy vignettes, representing any scene that happened momentarily to shape itself in the ever-shifting kaleidoscope of imagination, a glimpse of sea between two rocks, a rising moon and a ship crossing its disk, a group of reeds and water flags and a naiad's head crowned with lotus flowers rising out of them, an elf sitting in a hedge sparrow's nest under a wreath of hawthorn bloom. One morning I fell to sketching a face. What sort of a face it was to be, I did not know or care. I took a soft black pencil, gave it a broad point, and worked away. Soon I had traced on the paper a broad and prominent forehead and a square lower outline of visage. That contour gave me pleasure. My fingers proceeded actively to fill it in with features. Strongly marked horizontal eyebrows must be traced under that brow. Then followed naturally a well-defined nose with a straight ridge and full nostrils. Then a flexible looking mouth by no means narrow. Then a firm chin with a decided cleft down the middle of it. Of course, some black whiskers were wanted and some jetty hair tufted on the temples and waved about the forehead. Now for the eyes. I had left them to the last because they required the most careful working. I drew them large. I shaped them well. The eyelashes I traced long and somber, the irids lustrous and large. Good, but not quite the thing, I thought, as I surveyed the effect. They want more force and spirit and I wrought the shades blacker, that the lights might flash more brilliantly. A happy touch or two secured success. There I had a friend's face under my gaze, and what did it signify that those young ladies turned their backs on me? I looked at it. I smiled at the speaking likeness. I was absorbed and content. Is that a portrait of someone you know? asked Eliza, who had approached me unnoticed. I responded that it was merely a fancy head and hurried it beneath the other sheets. Of course, I lied. It was, in fact, a very faithful representation of Mr. Rochester. But what was that to her or to anyone but myself? Georgiana also advanced to look. The other drawings pleased her much, but she called that an ugly man. They both seemed surprised at my skill. I offered to sketch their portraits, and each in turn sat for a pencil outline. Then Georgiana produced her album. I promised to contribute a watercolor drawing. This put her at once into good humor. She proposed a walk in the grounds before we had been out two hours. We were deep in a confidential conversation. She had favored me with a description of the brilliant winter she had spent in London two seasons ago, of the admiration she had there excited, the attention she had received, and I even got hints of the titled conquest she had made. In the course of the afternoon and evening, these hints were enlarged on, various soft conversations were reported, and sentimental scenes represented, and, in short, a volume of a novel of fashionable life was that day improvised by her for my benefit. The communications were renewed from day to day. They always ran on the same theme, herself, her loves, and woes. It was strange she never once adverted either to her mother's illness or her brother's death or the present gloomy state of the family prospects. Her mind seemed wholly taken up with reminiscences of past gaiety and aspirations after dissipations to come. She passed about five minutes each day in her mother's sick room and no more. Eliza still spoke little. She had evidently no time to talk. I never saw a busier person than she seemed to be, yet it was difficult to say what she did or rather to discover any result of her diligence. She had an alarm to call her up early. I know not how she occupied herself before breakfast, but after that meal she divided her time into regular portions, and each hour had its allotted task. Three times a day she studied a little book, which I found on inspection was a common prayer book. I asked her once what was the great attraction of that volume, and she said the rubric. Three hours she gave to stitching with gold thread the border of a square crimson cloth, almost large enough for a carpet. In answer to my inquiries after the use of this article, she informed me it was a covering for the altar of the new church lately erected near Gateshead. Two hours she devoted to her diary, two to working by herself in the kitchen garden, and one to the regulation of her accounts. She seemed to want no company, no conversation. I believe she was happy in her way. This routine sufficed for her, and nothing annoyed her so much as the occurrence of any incident which forced her to vary its clockwork regularity. 
She told me one evening, when more disposed to be communicative than usual, that John's conduct and the threatened ruin of the family had been a source of profound affliction to her, but she had now, she said, settled her mind and formed her resolution. Her own fortune she had taken care to secure, and when her mother died, and it was wholly improbable, she tranquilly remarked that she should either recover or linger long, she would execute a long-cherished project, seek a retirement where punctual habits would be permanently secured from disturbance and place safe barriers between herself and a frivolous world. I asked if Georgiana would accompany her. Of course not. Georgiana and she had nothing in common. They never had. She would not be burdened with her society for any consideration. Georgiana should take her own course and she, Eliza, would take hers. Georgiana, when not unburdening her heart to me, spent most of her time in lying on the sofa, fretting about the dullness of the house and wishing over and over again that her Aunt Gibson would send her an invitation up to town. It would be so much better, she said, if she could only get out of the way for a month or two till all was over. I did not ask what she meant by all being over, but I suppose she referred to the expected decease of her mother and the gloomy sequel of funeral rites. Eliza generally took no more notice of her sister's indolence and complaints than if no such murmuring, lounging object had been before her. One day, however, as she put away her account book and unfolded her embroidery, she suddenly took her up thus. Georgiana, a more vain and absurd animal than you, was certainly never allowed to cumber the earth. You had no right to be born, for you make no use of life. Instead of living for, in, and with yourself, as a reasonable being ought, you seek only to fasten your feebleness on some other person's strength. If no one can be found willing to burden her or himself with such a fat, weak, puffy, useless thing, you cry out that you are ill-treated, neglected, miserable. Then, too, existence for you must be a scene of continual change and excitement, or else the world is a dungeon. You must be admired, you must be courted, you must be flattered, you must have music, dancing, and society, or you languish, you die away. Have you no sense to devise a system which will make you independent of all efforts and all wills but your own? Take one day, share it into sections to each section apportion its task leave no stray unemployed quarters of an hour ten minutes five minutes include all do each piece of business in its turn with method with rigid regularity the day will close almost before you are aware it has begun and you are indebted to no one for helping you to get rid of one vacant moment you have had to seek no one's company conversation sympathy forbearance you have lived in short as an independent being ought to do Take this advice, the first and last I shall offer you, when you will not want me or anyone else happen what may. Neglect it. Go on as heretofore, craving, whining, and idling, and suffer the results of your idiocy, however bad and insufferable they may be. I tell you this plainly, and listen, for though I shall no more repeat what I am now about to say, I shall steadily act on it. After my mother's death, I wash my hands of you. From the day her coffin is carried to the vault in Gateshead Church, you and I will be as separate as if we had never known each other. You need not think that because we chance to be born of the same parents, I shall suffer you to fasten me down by even the feeblest claim. I can tell you this, if the whole human race ourselves accepted were swept away and we too stood alone on the earth, I would leave you in the old world and betake myself to the new. She closed her lips. You might have spared yourself of the trouble of delivering that tirade, answered Georgiana. Everybody knows you are the most selfish, heartless creature in existence, and I know your spiteful hatred towards me. I have had a specimen of it before in the trick you played with me about Lord Edwin Vere. You could not bear me to be raised above you, to have a title, to be received into circles where you dare not show your face, and you acted the spy and informer and ruined my prospects forever. Georgiana took out her handkerchief and blew her nose for an hour afterwards. Eliza sat cold, impassable, and assiduously industrious. True, generous feeling is made small account of by some, but here were two natures rendered, the one intolerably acrid, the other despicably savorless for the want of it. Feeling without judgment is a washy drought indeed, but judgment untempered by feeling is too bitter and husky a morsel for human deglutition.
It was a wet and windy afternoon. Georgiana had fallen asleep on the sofa over the perusal of a novel. Eliza was gone to attend a saint's day service at the new church, for in matters of religion she was a rigid formalist. No weather ever prevented the punctual discharge of what she considered her devotional duties. Fair or foul, she went to church thrice every Sunday, and as often on weekdays as there were prayers. I bethought myself to go upstairs and see how the dying woman sped, who lay there almost unheeded. The very servants paid her but remittent attention. The hired nurse, being little looked after, would slip out of the room whenever she could. Bessie was faithful, but she had her own family to mind and could only come occasionally to the hall. I found the sick room unwatched, as I had expected. No nurse was there. The patient lies still and seemingly lethargic. Her livid face sunk in the pillows. The fire was dying in the grate. I renewed the fuel, rearranged the bedclothes, gazed a while on her who could not now gaze on me, and then I moved away to the window. The rain beat strongly against the panes. The wind blew tempestuously. One lies there, I thought, who will soon be beyond the war of earthly elements. Whither will that spirit, now struggling to quit its material tenement, flit when at length released? In pondering the great mystery, I thought of Helen Burns, recalled her dying words, her faith, her doctrine of equality of disembodied souls. I was still listening in the thought to her well-remembered tones, still picturing her pale and spiritual aspect, her wasted face and sublime gaze as she lay on her placid deathbed and whispered her longing to be restored to her divine father's bosom when a feeble voice murmured from the couch behind. Who is that? I knew Mrs. Reed had not spoken for days. Was she reviving? I went up to her. It is I, Aunt Reed. Who I was her answer who are you? Looking at me with surprise and sort of alarm, but still not wildly. You are quite a stranger to me. Where is Bessie? She is at the lodge, aunt. Aunt, she repeated. Who calls me aunt? You are not one of the Gibsons, and yet I know you. That face and the eyes and forehead are quite familiar to me. You are like, why, you are like Jane Eyre. I said nothing. I was afraid of occasioning some shock by declaring my identity. Yet, said she, I am afraid it is a mistake. My thoughts deceive me. I wished to see Jane Eyre, and I fancy a likeness where none exists. Besides, in eight years she must be so changed. I now gently assured her that I was the person she supposed and desired me to be, and seeing that I was understood and that her senses were quite collected, I explained how Bessie had sent her husband to fetch me from Thornfield. I am very ill, I know, she said ere long. I was trying to turn myself a few minutes since and find I cannot move a limb. It is as well I should ease my mind before I die. What we think little of in health burdens us at such an hour as the present is to me. Is the nurse here or is there no one in the room but you? I assured her we were alone. Well, I have twice done you a wrong which I regret now. One was in breaking the promise which I gave my husband to bring you up as my own child. The other, she stopped. After all, it is of no great importance, perhaps, she murmured to herself. And then I may get better, and to humble myself to her is so painful. She made an effort to alter her position, but failed. Her face changed. She seemed to experience some inward sensation, the precursor, perhaps, of the last pang. Well, I must get it over. Eternity is before me. I had better tell her. Go to my dressing case, open it, and take out a letter you will see there. I obeyed her directions. Read the letter, she said. It was short and thus conceived. Madam, will you have the goodness to send to me the address of my niece, Jane Eyre, and to tell me how she is? It is my intention to write shortly and desire her to come to me at Madeira. Providence has blessed my endeavors to secure a competency, and as I am unmarried and childless, I wish to adopt her during my life and bequeath her at my death whatever I may have to leave. I am, Madam, etc., etc., John Eyre Madeira. It was dated three years back. Why did I never hear of this, I asked, because I disliked you too fixedly and thoroughly ever to lend a hand in lifting you to prosperity. I could not forget your conduct to me, Jane, the fury with which you once turned on me, the tone in which you declared you abhorred me the worst of anybody in the world, the unchildlike look and voice with which you affirmed that the very thought of me made you sick and asserted that I had treated you with miserable cruelty. 
I could not forget my own sensations when you thus started up and poured out the venom of your mind. I felt fear as if an animal that I had struck or pushed had looked up at me with human eyes and cursed me in a man's voice. Bring me some water. Oh, make haste. Dear Mrs. Reed, said I, as I offered her the drought she required, think no more of all this. Let it pass away from your mind. Forgive me for my passionate language. I was a child then. Eight, nine years have passed since that day. I tell you I could not forget it, and I took my revenge for you to be adopted by your uncle and placed in a state of ease and comfort was what I could not endure. I wrote to him. I said I was sorry for his disappointment, but Jane Eyre was dead. She had died of typhus fever at Lowood. Now act as you please. Write and contradict my assertion. Expose my falsehood as soon as you like. You were born, I think, to be my torment. My last hour is racked by the recollection of a deed which, but for you, I should never have been tempted to commit. If you could but be persuaded to think no more of it, Aunt, and to regard me with kindness and forgiveness. You have a very bad disposition, said she, and one to this day I feel it impossible to understand. How for nine years you could be patient and quiescent under any treatment, and in the tenth break out all fire and violence, I can never comprehend. My disposition is not so bad as you think. I am passionate, but not vindictive. Many a time as a little child, I should have been glad to love you if you would have let me, and I longed earnestly to reconcile to you now. Kiss me, aunt. I approached my cheek to her lips, but she would not touch it. She said I oppressed her by leaning over the bed and again demanded water. As I laid her down and I raised her and supported her on my arm while she drank, I covered her ice-cold and clammy hand with mine. The feeble fingers shrank from my touch. The glazing eyes shunned my gaze. Love me, then, or hate me as you will, I said at last. You have my full and free forgiveness. Ask now for God's and be at peace. Poor suffering woman, it was too late for her to make now the effort to change her habitual frame of mind. Living, she had ever hated me. Dying, she must hate me still. The nurse now entered, and Bessie followed. I yet lingered half an hour longer, hoping to see some sign of amity, but she gave none. She was fast relapsing into stupor, nor did her mind again rally. At twelve o'clock that night, she died. I was not present to close her eyes, nor were either of her daughters. They came to tell us the next morning that all was over. She was by that time laid out. Eliza and I went to look at her. Georgiana, who had burst into loud weeping, said she dared not go. There was stretched Sarah Reed's once robust and active frame, rigid and still. Her eye of flint was covered with its cold lid. Her brow and strong traits wore yet the impress of her inexorable soul. A strange and solemn object was that corpse to me. I gazed on it with gloom and pain. Nothing soft, nothing sweet, nothing pitying or hopeful or subduing did it inspire. Only a grating anguish for her woes, not my loss, and a somber, tearless dismay at the fearfulness of death in such a form. Eliza surveyed her parent calmly. After a silence of some minutes, she observed, with her constitution, she should have lived to a good old age. Her life was shortened by trouble. And then a spasm constricted her mouth for an instant. As it passed away, she turned and left the room, and so did I. Neither of us had dropped a tear.